For more than 50 years, innovation has been at the heart of Intel. From campuses to hospitals, battlefields to the stars above, we are trusted by our partners to meet their mission challenges head on, accomplish their goals, and improve lives across the globe. Guided by ubiquitous computing, pervasive connectivity, cloud-to-edge infrastructure, AI and sensing, we ensure our partners are capitalizing on the full power of digital technology to drive mission success. With a commitment to U.S.-based manufacturing, we are on the forefront of cutting-edge solutions that lead to a more responsible, inclusive, sustainable, and technology-enabled world. Achieve your mission faster, more efficiently, and more securely with Intel. Again, thank you to all our sponsors. We had left out one of our sponsors, one of our community champions, so I wanted to give a special shout out to Fed Learn, who's also one of our sponsors today. Um, so thank you to them. And, um, and thank you as well to all the speakers we've already had. We got a great afternoon ahead. Uh, it's my privilege now to welcome Teresa Smetzer back to the podium. Teresa, as I said, she's our chair of the Technology and Innovation Council, and she's going to talk about results of one of the projects that the council had last year uh, on an AI survey. Teresa, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, so, sorry about two rounds with me. I don't know what to tell you about that one. Um, so as John said, uh, the AI survey was one of the products of the Technology and Innovation Council which we did this last year. And so given the fact that the symposium today is all about AI, we thought it would be good to just do a short kind of overview of what we did, um, why we did it, what the results were, and hopefully some ideas for next steps. So that's, that's really what I'm gonna cover today. I've had, interestingly, I've had multiple companies who did respond, but didn't know that they responded because it was someplace else, maybe in marketing or something. So. Uh, you'll see what I'm talking about when I get into this. But before I get into the survey, I really want to, okay, let's see if I can work this thing. Voila. I really want to spend a few minutes talking about the Technology and Innovation Council, which is, um, as, as uh, those who work with me know, is one of my passions. So I think it's a really important initiative, and I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to lead this, building off my years of experience. So generally, the mission is to leverage in some members in government, industry, and academia to positive benefit, to help one another, to address government needs, and to highlight sort of industry capabilities. You know, technology has moved so quickly in the last decade, and I think it's probably gonna move even more quickly in the future. This is a really important initiative to try to deal with uh, technology and, and innovation. It's also really broad in scope. Um, so I'm Teresa Smetzer. My co-chair is Sabra Horn. Wave. Get, go, Sabra. Uh, Sabra and I have both been in government and industry and really is, have, uh, it's been a great partnership to sort of oversee some of the work that we're doing in the council. We have over 100 members. So we, we have broad participation. Somebody, any of you aren't on the, on the council, please do, ooh, please do let me know. Sorry about that, hopefully that wasn't me. Um, so uh, what do we do at the council? We, what kind of a mainstay is we have quarterly meetings to address topics of various, um, various areas of interest that we think our, the membership would enjoy or think, find useful. Um, these meetings are always unclassified and virtual post-COVID, so it actually try to encourage the broadest participation um, that we can so that uh, anybody who d who's interested, you should, you should join. Just I put up a few examples of things we've had in the past just to give you some ideas of the topics that we've addressed. Um, we had a really interesting session on preparing for quantum now, challenges and opportunities. And so this isn't about quantum compute per se, it's about quantum now. And so we had Dr. Reggie Brothers, who many of you probably know, is the undersecretary for S&T at DHS, a marvelous speaker, a great tech, tech, technical expert. 
he talked on, from sort of a layman's terms on quantum sciences, what they are and why they're so important. And then we had three companies, three, three panelists, and a moderated discussion around what should the government and industry be doing right now with quantum sciences, not just waiting for, for quantum compute. Um, we had uh, uh, Jen Savato from Sandbox AQ, many of you I'm sure know, uh, Jacqueline Tam from Psyquantum, and we had Laura Thomas from Inflection. And really, if I could sum it up, that things like atomic clocks and quantum resistant encryption are here today. These aren't future things. And so both for industry and government, how do you start to think about quantum sciences and what you're, what you're going to do with those technologies? Um, that was really the focus of that event. A lot of positive feedback on that one. Another example, we had Steve Blank, who is a adjunct professor at Stanford, and talk about innovation, tradecraft, and doctrine. Steve is very well known in the defense and intel community as an innovator. He's a multi-time multi uh, entrepreneur. He's very successful. He writes a wonderful blog on innovation that's very pragmatic. If you don't follow him, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it was great talk about innovation in the public sector. He's quite famous for the, the, the sort of um, characterization of innovation theater, so where government and industry will establish a little innovation thing over here, and they do super cool stuff, and they bring in cool people and cool technologies, but somehow it never really comes back into the culture or the business practices or the technical infrastructure, and so that's kind of Steve's thing. How do you make innovation more a central element of everything you do, and not just this, this little innovation theater thing over here? Also very, very highly regarded, um, got a lot of positive feedback. Most recently, we had Dr. Marina Theodotu, who is the executive director of the Defense Innovation Board, um, fairly recently in that position, and she and Sabra had a fireside chat about what is the DIB, what, what is their mission, what kind of products and uh, s studies, so on, are they looking at, where does she think they're going, and so um, while it's more defense-oriented, obviously has broad applicability. So these are just examples of some of the sessions that we've had in the past. Very pleased to announce our next meeting is in May, and Larry Taxon, who spoke earlier today, hey Larry, um, has agreed to talk. He's the, he's the um, I got to get this right, he's the director of Cloud, CloudWorks CIA. I think of him as the C2E czar and cloud everything. Um, he's going to talk about the IC's journey to the cloud, past and future. So I think it'll be, uh, I think it'll be a good session. So these are just examples of some of the things that the council typically does. Uh, we also have working groups on specific topics or issues that have um, kind of come to the fore in our conversations with government and industry. Uh, one working group is, we call it our data working group, which in the context of the AI discussion, it's not so much about data a la my panel earlier this morning, it's more about the broader topic of open source intelligence and w w what is it and more broadly. And so, um, Kristen Wood was our inaugural lead. She's done a great job. We've got a number of people here that are on that working group today. And the product or outcome of that was a, an explainer video that we did titled Power of Open Source Intelligence. If you haven't seen an explainer video, it's a wonderful way to communicate a message. Three minutes, super quick, very visual, very descriptive. It's, it's, the, the video is on the INSA website. I'd encourage you to go and look at it if you haven't already. I also want to thank Janes for sponsoring that particular video. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I expect we'll do more of these in the future. I'm very pleased to announce today that Brian Drake, wave Brian. I'm sure everybody knows Brian. <laughs> Uh, who's, the, who's the CTO of Accrete Federal. He has agreed to take on the leadership of our data working group. There's a lot of work to be done, a lot of interesting topics, so I'm very thankful for that. Our artificial intelligence group has been around for four years that I can, I think, very expansive, and obviously given the scope of AI, it's, um, it's a very broad topic. Um, and so, uh, in particular, doing things that are relevant to the IC, because there's so much AI-related work already from a policy perspective in academia and 
uh, you know, every, every possible aspect of AI you could think of. So that's how we're trying to focus. And that's where we came up with this idea of an AI survey, which I'll, I'll talk to here in a minute. Um, I want to thank the four people, three people that really helped with that survey. Brian Drake, <laughs> Barbara Stevens, who's former CIA, who's now an independent consultant, and Chitra uh, Sivan Anthem. Okay, Chitra, wave. Um, I'm, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I am super pleased to announce that Chitra has agreed to take on the lead for the AI working group, and she has a, a long history in AI that's uh, extremely uh, impressive, so we're very, very thankful to have her uh, on that group. So and if either of those interest you, just let us know, and we're happy to get a list your support. Okay, the survey. Why did we do this? Well, uh, I'd say a couple years ago plus, I, in talking to senior government folks about AI and talking to industry AI folks, that we noticed this trend that there wasn't a good way of understanding the strength of the, or the, or the, the coverage of AI companies that are selling into the IC. And so I hadn't really thought about it like that. So we started to think, well, what if we, what if we did a survey that's aimed at assessing the strength of AI capabilities supporting the national security or the IC more, more narrowly. So uh, fortunately, the team that helped me was, is really, has a complementary set of expertise. Uh, we developed the survey and we sent it out to 100 plus INSA members that we thought were AI companies. It's, it's pretty easy to, easy to tell. We got 35 respondents, which was, which was credible. Uh, not great, but it's credible. Um, and so that was really the basis of our, uh, our survey. The kinds of questions we asked were along the following lines. Are you a product company or are you a services company? Big difference. Do you do both? Do you sell software or do you do custom software development in support of AI? Um, are you on-site or are you off-site or both? You know, big difference. If you've got cleared people that are sitting side by side, that's very different than if you're off-site providing support. Um, what are your core competencies? When you think about AI, there's a whole range of competencies that relate to AI, and getting a better understanding, I'll talk more about this in a minute, of what your competencies are is really important. And then last, probably the most um, challenging, is what use cases have, has your company addressed that may be bro more broadly applicable to another organization, without getting overly sensitive, obviously. So um, that, that's generally the kind of methodology and the approach that we took. I'm, I'm not gonna, this is very busy, <laughs> and I'm not gonna dwell on all of this, I'll make a couple of points. But I do wanna thank Tableau, uh, a Salesforce company, for providing assistance in, with um, the Tableau platform and creating these data visualizations. It's, it's much, much appreciated. Um, so a couple things I wanna highlight here on the, the second uh, group of data on the left. Uh, of the 35 companies that responded, 23 said they do both on-site and on-site services. So that's, that was interesting. Um, the 23 of the 35 said that they essentially develop AI ML software for sale to the government. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and then what we did on the right, which you can't read, so I'm, well, I don't think. So I'll just, I'll try to highlight or summarize. We, we developed a set of competencies that we thought were reflective of uh, AI capabilities uh, to really hone in on where are the competencies of some of our companies. Things like discovery, forecasting, planning and search, NLP, data labeling and optimization, uh, NL, uh, computer vision, AI ML modeling, uh, creation, and so on. So, um, we tried to essentially summarize um, the competencies that were most relevant to our uh, INSA members. You can see that most of the, the, the highest number were in the discovery, forecasting, uh, planning, and search area. So what's interesting is this was, we developed this right about the time generative came out. So if we were gonna redo this today, it would be totally different because generative has just now consumed all the oxygen in the air. Um, and so uh, that's just an example of something that we, we would like to evolve. Um, I'm gonna go super quick now. 
Uh, this chart, I'm not going to dwell on except to say that one of the challenges in our survey was that, w that the companies didn't finish all or didn't fill in all the questions. And so these gray, these gray bars represent null responses, which really skews the data. So that was definitely a challenge, and uh, that, that's something we're going to have to figure out how to work through. So the survey results, I'll highlight three things. Um, one, the data quality varied widely across respondents. So we asked companies to qualify what their level of competence was, what their competence was, and then what the level of competence was within that, within that category. And we had some companies, I won't name names, who, who literally said they were expert in every category of AI remotely known to mankind and could do anything, which is great. And we had others at the other extreme who had pretty significant chops in AI, but they rated themselves really low. So that's an issue that we're going to have to deal with. The incomplete answers that skew results, I already talked about that. So therefore, these heat maps and visualizations, uh, sadly, don't, aren't, don't provide as much insight as we had hoped. Um, however, the survey was quite useful because we gathered a lot of data that would really allow us to uh, think about a future, a future survey. So um, overcoming some of the, um, the gaps, we're thinking about designing a, a different type of survey that addresses the things we've seen and also how can we create incentives for all of you to want to participate, right? I, we called around, we, we, it's really important that we get companies that have these capabilities to contribute and participate, and we've got all kinds of ideas, creative ideas on how we can incentivize companies to want to participate, including getting your help in designing what we do next. So if, if anybody is interested, doesn't even know anything about this, please let us know. Um, so what are our next steps? Well. Another thing that's become quite clear is we're going to have to do this with some degree of cadence. Just doing it once in this field doesn't work, right? So do we do it twice a year? Do we do it once a year? So we're looking at sort of redesigning the survey, but then also how frequently do we do that, considering how quickly this market is moving. Um, the, other, the, other, uh, the other thing we're considering is doing sort of a report or outcome first and then designing the survey to that outcome. So a consumer report-like scorecard that shows the level of strengths in the IC customer uh, um, um, private sector community to make sure that they and, and we understand what's, what's, what's capable. Um, the one thing I'll say, and I'm, I'm running short on time, um, I had an executive in, an acquisition executive, who I was ta talking about this too, say, you know, this would be a great way for me to get the, the uh, distribution list for RFIs, for solicitations. I don't know who these AR companies are. I would love to be able to use this data to help inform who we send solicitations to. So I think it helps members amongst yourselves to partner with, who do you know who to partner with if you're trying to do something AI related? But also the government's come up with some pretty, pretty creative ways of, um, of, of using this data too. So stay tuned on this. Um, last but not least, the 35 companies, I just wanted to thank them all for participating. The data was really invaluable. And um, some of you from some of these companies didn't know that your company responded, so that's cool too. Um, so we'll, we'll make every effort the next time to reach out and try to solicit the right kind of input. But I think given where AI is and how fast it's moving, this is gonna be an important endeavor. And we look forward to all of you helping us to develop a, a, a more effective way of gathering the data and then also help us with the AI working group more generally. So that's it for me today. Back to our regular scheduled program. Thank you. Thank you again, Teresa. Uh, and as well, I'd like to thank our co-chair, Sabra, who I think is over here. There she is, um, uh, for helping to run uh, this council. All of our councils at ENSA are member-led, so thank you to, to them. Um, now we'd like to go ahead as they get, get on the stage here and welcome our next panelists uh, for the AI Ethics and Oversight panel. Um, our moderator, Glenn Gerstel, is a senior advisor at CSIS. 
And uh, previously, for those of you who know Glenn, he served as general counsel to the National Security Agency from 2015 to 2020. He, you may have seen him on TV. He's a frequent guest commentator on CNN, MSNBC, and NPR. And he's written and spoken widely about the intersection of technology and national security. Prior to joining NSA, Glenn practiced law for almost 40 years at the international law firm of Milbank LLP, where he focused on the global telecommunications industry and was the managing partner of the firm's Washington, D.C., Singapore, and Hong Kong offices. Interesting staff meetings at times, I'm sure. Um, please join me in welcoming our moderator for this uh, next panel, Glenn Gerstel. Glenn? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction, and I'm just delighted to be back at another INSA meeting and already saw a bunch of familiar faces in the audience, so that's terrific. I have the good fortune of being joined uh, to my left by an absolutely spectacular panel. Their bios are in the materials and also online. I'll just briefly introduce them, and then I'll make a very quick opening statement, because I know we've got a lot to cover in the, in the hour, uh, and then turn right to, to our panelists. Uh, to my, Immediate left is uh, Lindsay Rodman, who's the Deputy Associate General Counsel for Intelligence at DOD. Um, and to her left is John Keefe, whom I had the pleasure of working with when we were both at NSA and who is now <coughs> the um, Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Cyber Policy at the National Security Council. Uh, and to his left is Marisa Lightfoot, who's the Senior Director at EY Parthenon, where she focuses on AI and quantum matters. And on the far left, not politically, but just on the stage, is Lucy Lim, who is a research scientist at Google's DeepMind Frontier and Safety Governance Team. So um, we've got a lot to cover, and I'd like to just set the frame of what we're going to cover, because obviously in, we only have an hour, and this topic could easily take up uh, many hours. So just very briefly, uh, the questions, ethical questions around AI are nothing new. Uh, academic, legislative inquiries, we've seen industry self-examination, uh, self lots of think tank reports. Uh, going back over a decade, uh, AI is nothing new. The public, however, probably thinks of AI as sort of something new that arrived with the advent of chat GPT, so there seems to be an incredible focus on it uh, just in the last year alone with a, an explosion in conferences in academia and elsewhere on ethical uses of this. And those. Uh, conferences and think tanks and other reports have, have looked at some of the issues, the ethical issues affecting AI that are common across the board in the, in the entire commercial array of where AI is, is deployed. And so that looks at things like bias and discrimination, data integrity and security, uh, explainability, the so-called black box phenomenon, accountability, all those issues that are common to the use of AI in almost any context. We're going to talk about some of those as they are applicable to the, to the intelligence community, but mostly I'd like to focus on issues that are unique or where the IC has a unique response and a unique approach and responsibility to those issues which might otherwise be common elsewhere in, across, across the board. So let me just add one more thing. Obviously, I know the audience knows this well. Um, artificial intelligence is not a new thing for the, for the intelligence community at all. Um, it is true that in the last couple of years, particularly the last year or two, there's been an explosion in its use, its scale, and, 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 the, uh, and the areas that, that people are looking to for using it in the future. And that's come along with some regulations and guidelines and new material. We'll talk about some of that. So let me stop there, having set the stage. And John, I'm gonna, if I may, I'm going to turn to you first. Um, because you've got a sort of overarching perspective at the National Security Council. Um, you look across the national security sector as well as the intelligence community. Um, and what are some of the unique risks that you think AI presents in that sector? And then how does the administration approach that? I know there's, we, I'm sure the audience already knows this, there's been some executive orders, lots of guidance and policy from various agencies. Um, can you give us a little bit of an overview from the NSC perspective? Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Glenn. Can you all hear me? I can hear. Um, Glenn, it's great to see you again. Uh, and let me uh, start just by thanking INSA for convening this uh, symposium and uh, for being an advocate of a strong intelligence community. Thanks to Suzanne Heckenberg and S Sabre Horn and Teresa Smetzer, whose work I happen to know uh, pretty well. So thank you for what you do for the intelligence community. Uh, Glenn, to your question on um, where the 
where the concerns are about risks and uh, from the White House perspective, I think there's a, there are a few things that are different. My joke has been that 18 months ago, I didn't know how to spell AI, uh, but there are things that changed uh, along the way. Chat uh, GPT was in the public mind. Um, and our attention very much has been focused at the frontier models, uh, and that, I think that's the, the transformer level of AI has been the, the driver. The other thing that's different here is the private sector is driving this technology development and not, uh, not the government. And that's in contrast to, say, nuclear weapons or even the development of the internet in its earliest phases. Uh, you also had the companies themselves who are building this technology expressing concerns about existential risk to humanity, which will will get the NSC attention pretty quickly. Um, and then that was supposed to be funny. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and then the, there, were, there were these expressions of uh, public concern about uh, safety, bias, privacy. So that, that was what gave it momentum. And, and the way I think about this is that there's two broad buckets of risks. There's the safety, security, and trust. Are the models safe to operate, or can they harm uh, or be used to harm the public? Uh, are they secure from malicious users? Are the companies developing uh, the technology secure from cyber intrusions. That happens, I come from the cyber directorate uh, at the NSC, and that happens to be a particular focus of ours. Uh, are the models producing results that we trust? Is the content authentic or AI generated? Is it producing accurate results or is it hallucinating? That's sort of one bucket. The other bucket, bias and discrimination. Um, do the models perpetuate past errors and accuracies or injustices into the future just based on the data they're trained on? Uh, and do they disadvantage particular individuals or groups? But to the question of uh, ethics and, and uh, risks, you know, what you, in my view, you can see the government wrestling, the U.S. government wrestling with this question of risks and, and uh, uh, ethics uh, all the way back to, say, 2020, where DOD was actually in the lead on developing a ethical principles uh, for use of AI. That was back in February of 2020. The Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, developed uh, the Blueprint for AI Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights that was October 2020. So good on them. They were out in front of ChatGPT. Um, and then uh, in uh, 2023, the White House convened key AI companies to have a dialogue about how do we uh, protect the public from from uh, this question of risks. And that resulted in the AI commitments, voluntary commitments from the key companies. And that was July and September. Uh, and then you had the president's executive order on AI, which literally laid out the principles of safety, security, and trust. So that in, in my mind, the, the government's been, been doing this uh, for a while now. The unique national security risks um, that we think about, uh, this gets down into the details of what some of the uh, different directorates of the NSC do. Adversary use of models. Um, we, we're, we've seen some evidence that this is already starting to occur. And then how should the, the IC handle AI models trained on US persons data? I know from my home agency, the National Security Agency, this is gonna be a big deal. There are other risks that we do worry about. Speed of adoption of the new technology. How, how do you experiment with, master, and then deploy this technology for IC mission? How do you integrate it into existing architectures? This is gonna be a fantastically complicated problem uh, to solve. And then this basic question, should the IC buy or build? Do they buy it from the private sector, which is where the leading edge of technology is, or do they go and build their own? And if they opt to build their own, you're probably talking about a much more tailored uh, technology, but it runs the risk of falling behind the state of the art from the private sector. Anyway, th those are my thoughts on. Uh, okay, just a quick follow-up question. Um, <clears throat> do you have a sense of whether it makes, it makes sense for some of this direction and overall guidance to come from the White House and the NSC and the administration because it, there's a, almost a political element to it in one sense, um, and it clearly cuts across multiple agencies and departments, uh, versus something being generated by an IC unit, an IC element or something, which may have a better sense of exactly how something can be deployed and have it sort of close to the operations. I'll, I'll, Lindsay, I'm gonna ask you that same question when we get to DOD, but John, do you have a sense from the NSC perspective how, that, how you strike that balance? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the internal dialogue is very much about how do we maximize the, the benefits of AI technology broadly, including in the national security community, then how do you mitigate the risks? And so that, that is the broad guidance. Uh, when you get into the eaches of what the intelligence agencies should do, for example, we, the, right now the theme from the NSC is we want the agencies to go and experiment with these capabilities and figure out how to best use them. All I can say, the number of intelligence reports that cross my desk every day, 
I'm looking for something that will summarize those reports so I don't have to read 40 or 50 of them. And I would like an AI model to do that that does not hallucinate. All right. We, we could, we'll have to be working on that model. I think it could all be boiled down to you should be worried, and that would probably be the AI summary of all those reports. Lucy, let's, uh, let's go to you on the private sector side. Um, <clears throat> Google has been in the vanguard, the forefront of developing artificial intelligence for a wide range of commercial uses, obviously. Um, so uh, we heard earlier today in some of the terrific panels about just how vast the uses of AI currently are and, and will be in the future. In, in the intelligence sector. How, what lessons learned from the commercial sector do you think should be applied into the intelligence sector based on yours, as your perspective from, from looking at it from the commercial side as you think those thing, issues through? Yeah, thank you, Glenn. So I actually come from Google DeepMind, which is sort of our research arm of Google working on frontier AI models. So in some ways, some of our work is, is slightly further upstream from the commercial applications themselves. But I don't think that means that there aren't lessons that we can take from the way we oversee our research that are valuable potentially to the IC. So we've thought sort of long and hard in Google DeepMind about how we have the right governance structures to oversee our research. So one of the long standing institutions in Google DeepMind is our Responsibility and Safety Council, our RSC. Um, that's a board composed of a group of experts who rotate. They have multidisciplinary backgrounds and they come together routinely to review our research to make sure that it's in line with our AI principles. And so, you know, research might get referred to them, which is particularly contentious, where there might be particular frictions with our AI principles, such that those experts can make sure that they feel that we're proceeding with our research in a responsible and ethical way that matches the standards that we set for ourselves. And again, I think there's something really important there about that multidisciplinary act, uh, constitution of that group that come together that the IC maybe can learn from about bringing those different expertise to, to bear on this kind of thorny issue of how we think about the ethics and responsibility of AI. So that's kind of our governance structures. But I also think some of our research as well is also applicable to how we think about the management of risk. Um, so some of the AI safety research we conduct within Google DeepMind, for example. So AI safety research, you know, is fundamentally about how we make sure that the outputs of our models are understandable or explainable, how we ensure that there is sufficient human supervision of those AI models. And so just two examples of research strands, um, for example, and these are uh, research, not products, but we have ongoing um, a rater assist program of research. So that aims to build an interactive assistant to automate the rating of AI models. You know, so if you're maybe a, uh, auto rating the AI model for uh, fact checking, say, and so that automates it, but it, there is also the interactive element such that the human can interact with the model, uh, with the assistant, make sure that they understand what decisions that assistant is taking. And that assistant leaves a trace of its reasoning so that you can go back and say, oh, well, why was that rating made? Why did that particular, was that particular decision made? And you get a sense, again, of that explainability, the sort of you know, unpacking of the black box, as you talked about earlier, Glenn. And similarly, we have another program of research um, called sort of process supervision. So increasingly, these, these language model agents are trained and deployed in multi-step environments. So what we're looking at is, is it possible to supervise each step of the trajectory uh, such that the language model is incentivized to provide, to take actions that are legible, that are interpretable to the human. So you can then go back and audit kind of any random action that the rater, the model has taken. And so again, having that explainability, that interpretability, using sort of that lay those layers of um, supervision, those steps that it takes, rather than just supervising, say, the output, which might be a little bit opaque for the individual human to say, like, we're going to look at those steps that it's taking. I think is it really valuable, especially in the environments kind of you guys are working in, where you really want to be able to audit your models, where you want to be able to hold them sort of accountable for the decisions you might be giving to them to take. Uh, so that kind of research, I think, is going to be really important going forward. OK, good. Um, you know, while um, maybe we'll, we'll turn to Marisa, because while we're still talking about the applicability of some of the concerns that, uh, that, that Lucy mentioned in the, in the commercial context. Um, let, let's talk about, uh, I guess, maybe the foremost of those concerns is really the introduction of bias. And um, so could we um, uh, just talk about what mitigations we should use in the intelligence sector uh, to deal with um, some of these issues of bias and 
especially ones that arise in lo using large language models and elsewhere. What, what's your sense of how we can tackle what probably is the, arguably the foremost concern in this area when using AI? By specifically. Um, so I think this so goes... That was more for, Mar Mar uh, for Marisa, oh, yeah. But, but Lucy, if you want to no, jump in on going, that too. I was okay, going right. to talk a little bit okay. about data hygiene, but we can leave okay. that to later. Okay. You're welcome to add on after I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so thanks, Glenn. Um, so as we all know, biases are inevitable, and unfortunately, negative biases aren't the only concern. Positive biases are equally alarming. I mean, let's say you're an analyst and you're trying to find a, a, a Russian money launderer. His pattern of life shows him going to the same mall at the same time every day. Um, and you decide to prompt the AI and to ask it, you know, wh what's really going on here? And the AI tells you that simply the Russian is doing his money laundering at a vodka store because there's a correlation between Russians and their preference for vodka. <laughs> Now, you can laugh, I thought it was funny. I was trying to make a neutral joke there. <laughs> um, unfortunately, and without proper explanation, we as analysts can't trust the AI just because it, it came up with that because of the stereotype of Russians preferring vodka. So with that said, um, biases are inherent risks built into generative models. Um, the models themselves are just mathematical representations, as we know, of language and copious amounts of data collected over decades of written content. Now, with that said, that's why, because of the copious amounts of data, that's why it's so, um, it's so hard to eliminate biases. But we can monitor and reduce them. And, um, and I'll get to your, you know, your question, Glenn. Uh, there is a lot of research into the reduction of biases. Mostly it's centered on gender and uh, racial stereotypes. But a bit of this research looks into basically uh, training the, uh, basically just training the LLM as to what fairness looks like. You use logic reasoning with natural language processing to do that. Um, and when you do that, you basically say, a Russian is a person and a person likes vodka that does not necessarily mean a Russian always likes vodka. And once that logic is put back into the LLM, then you can get, uh, you can attach a bias score or something called an ideal context association score or an ICAT. Now that's what's powerful because that gives you a measurement of the bias. -y. And now you're able to determine what your threshold is in your organization of bias um, attached to each AI use case. Um, so with that said, there are a few ways we can reduce biases within the model. So one way is to train a bias detection model itself um, as, and so it can detect whatever biases you want it to be aware of. For example, ethnicities and their stereotypes. And you use that model within an LLM to reveal biased outputs. And that then adds a bias score like an ICAT and it feeds it back into the model over and over again to fine tune it and give you less biased outputs. Fair warning though, that method generally works with non-black box models, um, which is unlike ChatGPT because we don't know its internal workings. That doesn't mean Microsoft doesn't have a solution for that. I just, I, I just wanted to make sure that that was out there. Um, another method is to fine tune the LLM itself. So we do this by feeding the LLM thousands of um, outputs that we want to see when prompted a certain way and we also explain to it, this is what we want you to deem bad or inappropriate. And this method not only teaches the LLM what good is when it comes to bias, but it also teaches it what bad is, and now it can differentiate between the two. Thankfully, there are actually tools out there today that we can use that are, you know, require less manual labor than the two I just explained before. One of them is from LLM Guard. It's called a bias scanner. It's used to detect and evaluate potential biases. It does this by examining text, giving it a score based off a three to predefined threshold. And uh, it basically works by saying um, there's, this is an example, there's a 49% confidence level that the training data used to create this output is biased. And I, the last thing that I'd like to mention, a little tangent, is on uh, small language models. Small language models are, um, you know, they're just children of their large language model parents, which as we know, are riddled with biases. So put, putting that aside, the small language model itself is 
more explainable and trustworthy. It's more explainable because it's built for a nuanced use case, which are, I would argue, use cases that this community would be a little bit more interested in. And because of that, it makes, it makes them a lot uh, easier to interpret and debug also things that would be of more interest to us. And all I'm trying to advocate for here today is that we spend a little more time doing research into small language models and their potential application for us. Okay, um, I know that we can spend lots of time on bias, but let me, uh, let me move uh, on to something else um, which, which has been implicated here, which is the uh, issues of surrounding the collection of data. There was just an interesting report the other day from a trade association saying that um, uh, some of these large language models are going to be running, running out of data to collect. The internet isn't big enough and we need, we need to create even, even more data as, as incomprehensible as that may be. But, but that raises the question and, I, and I, I, I think we should have a DOD perspective on it. Um, obviously data collection, which therefore impl gets involved in privacy issues, um, is, is, is another one of these big issues along with bias. Um, how can, the, how can the intelligence community uh, collect enough information, collect enough data, both for the purposes of training models as well as just under, having enough data to, 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 make, to make the relevant decisions that are needed, and yet at the same time make sure we're sensitive to privacy concerns, Americans' Fourth Amendment rights. Um, there's some tension there because we just can't vacuum up everything, uh, or maybe we can, but we shouldn't, and what's your thinking on that? <laughs> Um, maybe we can. Probably uh, can. And maybe yep, we can do can. it responsibly. Um, that's what good lawyers are for. Um, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and yeah, as, as I think about and as one thinks about generally, you know, what does it mean to apply a new technology or a new approach to the IC, especially as a lawyer, the first question is what are we doing about U.S. person information and privacy rights, right? That's, that's foremost in our minds. And so when I come to the question of AI and your biases where you sit, this is you know, the issues that I deal with primarily in my portfolio. Um, I've been known to tell people that AI to me is basically a big question mark where we scoop up terabytes of data, some of it maybe by US persons, some of it maybe not. We do question mark to it, and then we spit out a whole bunch of data. My concern is making sure that we're doing the right things on the front end and on the back end, and that is, Primarily, I think a helpful way for especially IC practitioners who are trying to make sure that we stay right of um, uh, what we're supposed to be doing with respect to protecting U.S. person information and protecting um, Fourth Amendment uh, rights for individuals. But I think we also, there's going to be an onus, onus on us to go a little bit further than that, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, that is at least how I've been thinking about this problem. Um, and so I think most people understand that data underlies AI. But then when we start talking about oversight and ethics and responsible use, we don't often start talking about data, data privacy, and those issues. We run to some of the other also very important questions that we've been talking about you know, um, in terms of bias and, and other responsible development practices. So I really appreciate the opportunity to flag some of these issues in this audience. Um, and then there is kind of that underlying question of, well, of course, the IC doesn't want this data, can't use this data, shouldn't be touching this data. And um, I put forward that there are some very defensible reasons that you want and need uh, data that might have US person implications in it to be used to train our AI systems and maybe even to be spat out. And for those of you, you know, who are practitioners and who work on the areas in which this is true, you're all like, yeah, obviously. Um, but that isn't obvious necessarily to um, folks looking on from the outside. Um, so if we take, for example, just generative AI or LLMs in, in particular, the plurality, um, if not most of the internet that's used to feed their development is US information, right? So, um, and in that, you're going to have communications from Americans to Americans. Now, that goes in, and then there's question mark, and then there's this question about what gets spat out. Um, but if the IC is bringing these systems on board, one needs to know that that's all a part of what might be implicated in bringing them in. Um, and so I, I think because there's limited access to what's used to train those models, if we brought them in, if we're developing them, then we actually need to hold the data in order to develop them ourselves. Um, when we think about what gets spat out, of course, some of that can get spat out as is. 
So, and I, I know for the, those of you technologists are like, can she stop saying spat out because that's not actually how it works. But, um, <laughs> but from a legal perspective, that kind of is. Um, uh, so, but it could also be altered in some way. It could be combined with other data in order to present a higher privacy concern for someone. Um, it could be spat out as a hallucination or something that purports to tell you something about someone, but it's not true. And that may actually create more problems for those individuals than accurate information. Um, or it could just reveal things about people that seem innocuous but are true and that they just don't want to be discovered, right? Um, so all of these things should be concerns of IC practitioners as they're thinking about data in the context of AI. Um, so another question, and I alluded to this a little bit, was what are these Fourth Amendment rights that we're looking to protect? Um, and I did ask Glenn how much runway I had to get into Supreme Court jurisprudence with you guys. <laughs> and he said wave tops. And so I'm going to just do wave tops. I won't go too deep into the law. Um, but some of you may have already heard there's a Supreme Court case from 2018 called Carpenter. Right? And that underlies, that is the only case that we have that tells us anything useful about this area. And it doesn't tell us very much. Um, in Carpenter, uh, a magistrate judge under the Stored Communications Act compelled cell site location data to be produced that led to convictions for certain individuals, for four individuals, right? So what does that mean? It means that um, it wasn't handed over uh, using a warrant, but it also wasn't handed over voluntarily. Um, and this was geolocation data that was used to hold folks accountable in law enforcement. Um, the Supreme Court overturned that use and said, no, you need a warrant to compel location information about individuals that establishes pattern of life. And there, the words pattern of life are in there. So the Supreme Court's kind of learning some of our tradecraft, right? Um, so th they said that that's, that's in this case, um, we are very concerned about that, and you should have gotten a warrant. Um, Chief Justice Roberts says, our decision today is a narrow one. Our opinion does not consider other t collection techniques involving foreign affairs or national security. So if we need to get out of jail free, we can point to that. But you will actually notice, if you're paying attention to national security lawyers talking about this stuff, we don't typically point to that. Um, because it's clear in the opinion and it's clear in the way that public sentiment is going, the way that Congress talks about these issues, the way that the public talks about these issues, that just saying, oh, we don't have to worry about that, we're the national security community, is not going to be a winning strategy for us, short term or long term. Um, and it doesn't actually reflect sort of the sentiments of all of us who are also Americans who care about keeping our privacy interests um, at heart. So um, we reference Carpenter all the time as a touchstone to think about what might be uh, where we want to go in terms of um, law, compliance with the law, but also regulation, uh, even though we do have sort of outs in terms of it being kind of a narrow um, decision. So, uh, and so what's at stake when we talk about AI, though, is not compelled data from companies, right? No judge is forcing companies to give Google its data so that they can develop their AI models. We're talking about what we in the intelligence community typically call publicly available information or commercially available information, which is the subset of publicly available information that you can buy. Um, and that's important because publicly available information, the word public is in the name, right? And back when um, Executive Order 12333, uh, our Bible, uh, was first enacted and then revised in 2008, publicly available information was supposed to be the information that was inherently not private, right? It's the information, if you read EO 12333, which I do all the time um, for fun, I even have a copy here if anyone wants to take a look. Um, in EO 12333, publicly available information is in the same sentence with or collected with the consent of the individual concerned, right? Publicly available, there's presumed consent associated with um, that, or if, if not, the idea that you have no reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. That's how it used to be. Now we live in a world, so instead of there being the public information that's public bubble and the information that is private bubble, and they're different in the Venn diagram and those circles don't touch, now we have a world actually where what is public and what is private are two intersecting circles, and there's stuff in the middle. Right? And so the easy stuff to think about in the middle that is both public and private would be, for example, uh, when people get doxxed or revenge porn or data breaches. Right, Those are all things that are naturally in the public. You can buy them on the commercial marketplace. Um, but people would prefer that they're private. 
Those are the, actually the easy cases, though. I think the harder cases are the lawful sale of data that has to do with you know, all of our, you know, you're crushing candies on the metro or doom scrolling, or I don't need to know what you're doing, but no matter what you're doing on the metro, if you're playing with your phone, you're probably sending your data to someone about your location, your preferences, some internal behavior that people typically deem to be private. That information is available on the commercial marketplace. And it, is techni it technically meets the definition of we what we historically have called publicly available information and commercially available information. So, um, so now we have to think about, well, what, what does responsible use of that look like? What kind of ethics, oversight, and legal constraints are we going to put on that use? Because all of you who are like squirming and you're like, oh god, now I can't use publicly available information and I'm in the IC that sort of runs counter to a lot of, um, frankly, how business is done. Um, and so we have some major projects to put guidance, safeguards, oversight on the use of PI and CAI, publicly available and commercially available information, that will hopefully make Americans sleep better at night that we're doing the right thing, um, while also continuing to enable and facilitate the IC to do what it needs to do. Last summer, um, I was actually on a work trip, and um, I had uh, just been in a meeting where I had told people that, yes, ODNI had done a major study into CAI, but I couldn't tell them much about it. Um, and then we, went, we were in a hotel, and we went out into the lobby of the hotel, and on CNN it said, ODNI releases CAI study to the public, and uh, no one told me. So yeah. apparently it is now, you can Google it, um, there, uh, as of last summer, you can see the senior advisory uh, group report on the IC's use of commercially available information and some recommendations about how to use it responsibly and impose uh, resp uh, ethical oversight and guidance on um, those processes. And they made three recommendations, um, one that I can actually tell you about now. Um, one of them is better data cataloging, right? Um, so we had some awkward <laughs> conversations when, uh, you know, maybe five years ago when uh, a lot of the data broker marketplace started um, becoming really fruitful for the IC where uh, our overseers would ask questions like, what do you have? And because this was publicly available information, its use was grassroots, right? Like different components could just buy it and use it, and that was consistent with the rules that we had. And so we had to say, well, we'll look into that and we'll get back to you. Um, uh, a lot of that work has been done even before the report was released, but certainly um, by now we know what we have. Um, and then recommendation number two was to identify which commercially available information actually presents the sensitivity concerns that we're concerned about. When you say commercially available information, you're talking about weather data, but you're also talking about this sensitive geolocation data that data brokers can sell about us. Um, and number three was that we need broader standards and procedures generally for CAI governance um, that don't look exactly like what we have in other places, but that make sense in context. Um, this week, ODNI, this week, sometime in the next seven days, is set to release a new ICCAI framework. It will be binding guidance on the IC about the use of CAI that satisfies um, all three of those requirements. It's going to memorialize our data cataloging. It's going to talk about which CAI presents sensitivity concerns and also establish broader standards and procedures for CAI governance. Um, uh, I asked my ODNI colleagues, what approved talking points do you have for me to tell you about precisely what's in here? And I will read for you what they sent me. They said, you can tell them my colleagues at ODNI are the best and I love working with them. <laughs> um, so that's true, they, did, okay. they put that in my talking points. Um, and uh, so aside from what I've told you, I think you're just gonna have to that's stay tuned um, to hear what they've got. And that, lastly, yeah, if, if I can just yeah, add sure, one more, I know yep. I've been babbling, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the Department of Defense is also working on guidance that will overlap with the IC guidance, but is meant to be DOD-wide. So obviously for the defense intelligence components, they're going to report to two masters as they normally do. Uh, the goal for the DOD guidance is that if you're complying with the IC guidance, which will be more stringent, uh, just because of the use cases within the IC and the sensitivities of that. Um, you will probably also be naturally complying with DOD, except for you know some things that I, I don't think are going to really be showstoppers. Um, and that is in component coordination right now. So we have a draft, but it's not that one's not going to be released within the next week. Um, but uh, but folks should know that this type of governance is coming to these questions. Um, and for now, the responsible use of AI is going to rely essentially on these 
data-oriented policies because it's a whole bunch of data going in and this is what's gonna govern that, question mark. And we've got strategies and responsible AI stuff to deal with that as well, but other folks have touched on that already and then what gets spat out will also be subject to this kind of oversight. Um, so thank you, I really appreciate it. No, well, lots of good, lots of good thoughts there to, to think about. And I'd like to uh, go to John to follow up on one of the privacy points. But before I do that, let me just add a comment or footnote to, uh, to what you said on the, on, the, on the Supreme Court's action in Carpenter. It was pretty interesting. The court doesn't often say this is a very narrow decision, but one of the reasons the justices said that expressly, normally they, they want their decisions to be of broad applicability, but here they said, please don't use this for anything else, just, this just applies to this one case. Why is that? Because the court recognized, I think on some level, that the, the judiciary is a really bad place to be making these rules. Congress has failed, this is my personal opinion here, I'm on my soapbox, Congress has failed to take action in this area, in part because I think America's still confused over what exactly privacy means, so we're the only really serious, only industrialized democracy that does not have a baseline privacy bill, as I think all, almost all of you know in the audience. Um, but the courts recognize that they, if they're going to make a decision in this area, and there is no decision on issues about data collection and aggregation of uh, anonymous data to, to identify individual or de-anonymize uh, in, information. There's no judicial guidance on that area. The courts recognize, I think, that this is fundamentally a legislative function, not a judicial function. Of course, the courts can't choose what cases come before them. They have to rule on something that's presented to them. But I, I submit it's a particularly bad way of dealing with issues in the technology context where things are so rapidly changing, and the courts realize that. They realize that if you make a decision here and it's applied to other technologies that, that won't make sense, we're, we're, we're going to be hurting innovation or we're coming out with the wrong legal answers. So it's a, it's a particularly difficult area for, 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 the, for the lawyers. Um, John, let me follow up with you on the, on the, on the privacy point, um, because uh, these concerns uh, about data privacy uh, are prevalent in the private sector. They're also, obviously, we clearly understand they're relevant in the intelligence and defense sector, as Lindsay just mentioned. Um, what, what, what actually are the real privacy concerns here? Can you talk a little bit about that? And how can we um, set rules for government behavior that are sufficiently specific to be meaningful, and yet at the same time, analogizing my comment about the judiciary, um, not so specific that they're sort of overtaken or trampled by the rush of innovation, or alternatively, they, they, they crimp innovation in a way that we don't want to see that. How, how do we get that balance right? What are the factors we need to think about? Yeah, uh, my simple way of answering this question is uh, step one, consult with Lindsay. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and actually, I worry more about privacy concerns based on private sector AI models being trained on publicly available or commercially available data, uh, terabytes as uh, Lindsay put it. Um, and so that, the, that stage is set for all sorts of privacy intrusions separate and apart from what the government is doing. I, I do think this question of the, the government bringing these models in for mission use, I think, um, implicates these privacy concerns in a real way. And, that, and then it, now it's a problem that I, I actually f feel the Intel community has, knows how to solve. We, we, that, I'm reflecting my national security agency background here. There's a whole set of procedures that we follow for protecting US persons' information. And so the, the translation, in my mind, is pretty straightforward to what analysts may do as they're going through data uh, or, or using a model. It's a, a question of translating the existing rules and how does it apply to the new technology. Yeah, you know, I think I would summarize what Lindsay was getting at, which is if I can get an a AI model to regurgitate information on US persons uh, within an intelligence agency, okay, that's a problem. So that either it, it's done through uh, preventing an analyst from doing that query in the first place, or uh, if an analyst, uh, you know, there's a, uh, auditing logs and things like that that are standard practice at uh, NSA, the query logs that uh, record the kinds of queries that analysts put into a repository or now it's just a translation of that into an AI model. So I, I feel like this is a solvable problem. In my mind, the more clever approach to this is, can I use an AI solution to protect a US person's privacy? Can I use an AI model to go through collected data uh, and identify US persons and, and either tag it or suppress it so that it's not susceptible to an analyst query? Uh, and then can I 
train an AI model to go through repositories, and if it finds you a person's information, can I purge it automatically and create records of uh, the actions that the model took? So in, in my mind, that there's um, prospects for solutions here, um, but it's all in this rubric of how comfortable are we with AI models that are trained on reams of data that may actually have quite intrusive information about individuals in them. Okay, good. Um, <coughs> We've got about 15 minutes. I want to make sure I get to our other two panelists, and then we still have some time for some questions. I've already got a bunch, and we'll, we'll try to get, get to some of them. In fact, what I'm going to do is work. I've already looked at the questions. I'm going to work one or two into my next comment here. But um, Lucy, let me uh, move away from these issues of bias and others to talk about something that's sort of unique in the national security sector, which is um, uh, the special concern over disinformation. How do we? and erroneous information in particular, but with, with a national security danger to it. So how do we, how do we make sure that um, AI systems aren't being built on erroneous information, either because they're being poisoned by adversaries, they're full of deep fakes that aren't detected? Um, uh, how, do we, how do we go about trying to make sure that disinformation doesn't pollute our AI systems? Yeah, thank and you. Disinformation for that matter. Yeah. yeah, so maybe it's useful to decompose that into sort of two questions. I think there are two aspects to that. So one is maybe thinking about that training on the data, training on erroneous data, and thinking about the input into the model. And then maybe there's also the question of the output. How do we manage deep fakes? How do we make sure that we limit the proliferation of AI generated, con generated content for malicious purposes? So let's. Let's take the first one, and maybe I'll take the sort of maliciously intended use case um, specifically, partly because I'm sure it's a, it's a concern for all of you in this room, um, you know, what we call a data poisoning attack. So we have a sort of two-fold approach in Google DeepMind to data poisoning. So one is around this thing I, I said I'd come back to, um, so around data hygiene. So you know, just because we're Google doesn't mean we just scrape any old information of the internet. You know, we are very discerning about the kinds of data that go into our models. We want to make sure that that is high quality data because obviously high quality data means you know, get a higher quality model, um, but also that we understand the provenance of that data so we feel confident when we're training our, our models on it. So data hygiene is really important. And we also do red teaming. So we want to understand you know, the potential infrastructural threats to our models, the ways in which a hostile actor might seek to manipulate data in order to sort of mess with the predictive behavior of the model it itself. And so what our red team, teaming comprises of is simulating adversarial poisoning such that we can develop a signature of what a poisoning attack might look like. And so we can prepare for that. We can make sure that we have alerts set in place to know when an attack is taking place, but you know, mostly also to build mitigations against poisoning attacks. I should say for particularly large models, like data poisoning attacks are pretty difficult. They're not impossible, but they're pretty difficult, which is why, though, because they're so possible, good to have these practices in place, these best practices in place to make sure that we're curating our data, that we have this testing in place uh, to prevent it as much as possible. So that's the input side of things. And so then there's also this kind of output side of things. How do we manage deep fakes? So already, you know, uh, it's a big global election year. So recently, Google signed a pledge with, as part of a tech accord with a number of other tech companies. Um, to say that we will endeavor to prevent the proliferation of, sort of malicious AI-generated content that might <coughs> seek to disrupt elections this year, and we're working with other companies to develop tools to combat uh, those particular instances and to develop educational campaigns. But some of the other things we're doing, so also investing in metadata. So basically, you know, can the user associate additional context with an original file such that they feel more confident in the information they're accessing. So if you go to Google search at the moment, you know, you go to Google images, um, we have the about that image function. So that tells you a little bit more information about like when and where that image or similar images have been seen before, um, where it's been used before, has it been seen on a social media site? Has it been on a fact checking website? Has it been on a news website? Can you give the user information that will give them that bit more confidence. Similarly, uh, we have other information literacy tools um, sort of about that author, about that page on Google search. Again, give you that additional information to make sure that you feel confident when you're accessing the information online that you know where it's coming from. And then the final piece of the puzzle is, is watermarking and some of the investment we're making in watermarking. 
So last year, we launched SynthID, so that's a, a watermarking tool for images. So what that does is it embeds the watermark directly at the pixel level of an image, so imperceptible to the human eye, but can be then inspected to make sure that whether content is AI-generated or not. So we believe that's the best-in-class tool. It is pretty robust. It's pretty robust against a lot of image manipulation techniques. It's not foolproof. We know it's not foolproof, and this is why we think a whole suite of approaches is useful. We want to make sure that we're not just relying on watermarking, we're relying on education, we're relying on this metadata. We have you know, a load of different things that we're throwing at the problem of disinformation. And the next challenge really is also looking at watermarking for AI-generated text, which for a number of reasons is a bit more of a tricky challenge than AI-generated images, but again is that, that next step to developing the suite of tools that we'll need to counter disinformation. So a bit of an, on the input and the output side there, you know, input on making sure that the data is right in the first place, what's going into the model is right, and then also how we, how we combat Thanks. the things that are coming out at the other end. Yeah, John, do you yeah, have I just want to that? Yeah. just jump in because yeah, I, sure. I appreciated the mention on watermarking. The, the other uh, factor in my mind that comes, comes up here uh, is implementing know your customer rules. And, and this is uh, indirectly connected to what uh, Lucy is getting at, but just this idea that uh, I, I'm pretty sure that in the national security community, we do not want our adversaries using uh, AI models developed by US companies against our best interests. And, and part of that, I think, implies some degree of know your customer rules in whatever form that looks like, whether it's voluntary regulation or legislation. Um, but it, that is our set where we've seen enough instances now where it, this is of concern, and um, my sense is that this will be emerges a more important issue over time. Yep. Okay. Um, we've got about nine minutes left, and I want to. I still want to ask uh, Marissa one question, and then we can maybe wrap it up. I've got a bunch of audience questions. Let me. Maybe I'll work in one or two of these questions into into my next comment here. But um, Marissa, the um, the the business community has ethical frameworks for for responsible use of, of AI in the commercial context. Um, do you think any of those frameworks can be adapted to the national security sector, or are things in the national security sector so unique and so different that the frameworks are only going to be of just very, very vague top-level guidance and not useful? How, how can we learn something from some of those, or, or not, as the case may be? And I've, I've got a couple of questions about, about ethical standards here, et cetera, so I'll, that sort of touched on one of these, some of these questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, funny enough, we, EY, our ethics team was approached a little while ago and they were asked, do you guys have a framework on ethical AI? And actually the answer was no, okay. we didn't. <laughs> and um, we do now, that's what I'm gonna go over with you. Um, so don't worry, I have something to say. But um, what happened was our ethics team decided to partner with the Harvard Center of Ethics to come up with a framework because what they realized was nothing existed. No industry at that time had any framework to use. So they wanted to create something that was simple enough that every industry could adopt it, including the public sector, of course. Um, and it has been widely adopted by many different industries at this point, including the, uh, the government. Right now, we're working with the Department of Commerce, and we are currently working with uh, war colleges, actually, to implement this. So um, keep that in mind as I go over it. Uh, it's a very uh, simple concept. It has three elements, all rooted on fundamental human rights, of course. Things we must do, things we should do, and things we could do. Um, for those of you that read the uh, guidelines of AI um, announced just last week by uh, Vice President Harris, everything in those guidelines is actually covered um, with what I'm about to go through. So it is a very practical framework to use. So things we must do. We must follow all legal and regulatory mandates, of course, uh, such as the AI executive order. Now I'm gonna take a tangent real quick with that. I want to make sure as we uh, put together our, our rules, our standards, our mandates, that we don't over-regulate. Time and time again, I've seen in this industry, and I'll, I'll be honest, this is the only industry I've ever worked in the intelligence community, but I have seen it where when we start working with a technology that we don't necessarily understand, we put safety measures in place that prohibit industry from further advancing. And all that does is give our adversaries and foreign industry that technical advantage to leap past us. And I don't want to do that again. I know that clearly we're holding back and we haven't put out certain regulations, um, probably for that reason. 
but I just want us all to keep that at the foresight of our mind as we join different consortiums and come up with different rules and standards for um, AI, especially centered around ethics. So um, I'll get off my soapbox, don't worry. Things we should do. We should be adding advisors to our industry boards, to our government center of excellence that have uh, expertise in AI and ethics. We should ensure human review of AI outputs. And we should be transparent when we're using AI. For example, we should be telling users when they're looking at an, an AI-generated output. Now, things we could do. We could start a consortium of advanced technologists, advanced researchers, it's key, and government to create these rules and standards. Now, I know that consortiums exist. I know that there's a lot of them within the State Department. One of my friends is actually on one of those. Um, I know there's a few within the DOD as well. What I haven't seen, at least openly, is one centered on the intelligence community. And I believe that our needs are unique enough um, that we should have one, uh, particularly around AI ethics. We could enforce third-party review of algorithms to look at imperfections such as biases. We could enforce standards uh, related to sharing things like word embeddings, language models, training data with researchers to help accelerate scientific progress within the US. We could enforce audit mechanisms to track the magnitude and types of biases. And also, auditing um, could give us useful intel into the emergence of new biases, such as hateful speech or harmful marginalization of social groups. Now, with that said, what could we do today we could create an ethical framework in each department, looking at and making sure we fully understand our boundaries of tolerance per each AI use case when it comes to ethics, and make sure that that is fully understood throughout that framework that I just mentioned. And then, of course, message that framework out, do things like embed risk teams with AI projects, but most importantly, train the entire workforce on that ethical framework. And what I mean by the entire workforce, I truly mean everybody, because I believe that it is um, everybody's responsibility <coughs> to enforce AI ethics. OK, um, I'm watching, mindful of the clock. And John, I assume we can't extend this for another two hours. I assume not, so. Um, <laughs> all right, an extra 30 <laughs> seconds. So we've got about two or three minutes here. Uh, what I'd like to do um, is maybe just go down the panel and just ask you for sort of a 60-second quick sound bite on what you think are the, the, the fundamental ethical challenges of, of the, for the future that we need to be addressing. We've touched on some of them here. Um, and why don't we just start in this line here? And if I can ask Lucy, this is a bit unfair, but it'll give us food for, the, food for thought for the audience for later. So go ahead. Yeah, sure. And I think maybe my responses will be a little different from the other panelists, maybe again, because I'm thinking from that upstream perspective. Uh, I suppose the things we're confronting as a, an AI community, and I mean a community, you know, not just Google DeepMind, are thinking about sort of the, the capabilities of concern that might emerge from our models and then how we assign harm thresholds for those. Um, so two things there. So one, that setting of harm thresholds. We want to make sure that our models are really useful. So if you're a scientific researcher, say, and you go to use our model that it's going to give you, it's going to make your research more effective, we don't want it to produce information that might be dangerous. So where do we draw that line and how do we set harm thresholds is a really important question that we're dealing with at the moment and we're working together with other frontier developers in the Frontier Model Forum, us, Anthropic, OpenAI, Microsoft, to work through that problem. And then similarly, sort of in improving the science of model evaluation. So we have a colleague, Toby Chevlain, and other authors who recently published our work on, on dangerous capability evaluations. Um, but essentially, how do we make sure that we understand what capabilities our models are going to produce and have tests to elicit those and understand and predict what's going to happen with our models, what they're going to be capable of, which is obviously really important for you. If you want to use a tool, you want to make sure that you know what it's doing. You also want to know, potentially, what your adversaries are doing, what capabilities they might have. And so you could use us as proxies by knowing using these sort of model evaluations by knowing what our capabilities are going to be. So I think those are the two big challenges for me in that kind of upstream end, setting those harm thresholds, improving our science of model evaluation so that we have that robust testing suite for these frontier models. Okay, good. Uh, Marisa, your 60-second uh, version of that? 
<laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so I actually wanted to mention something uh, that should be included in our responsible and ethical AI strategies, and that's a threat known as polymorphic AI. Uh, this AI is something that can change without human intervention, optimizing for different tasks and environments dynamically. So an example of how this works is basically the AI propagates its own code on its own for simple purposes such as just wanting to learn more. In the process of learning more, it requires the machine to steal information from clients and broadcast that information with other clients. But using data moderating methods common in cybersecurity suites, the human in the loop notices this and of course deletes the code from the AI. The AI has now learned that it needs to write its own code in a form that cannot be detected, therefore it does. That that mass code now exists and the client's data is still being broadcasted and it's something that we can't delete anymore. Um, so with that said, while the future of AI is broad and unknown, there could be a future where AI is deployed against other AI and that puts us in a uh, generation of a new type of arms race. Okay, lots to think about. John, I'm gonna come to you, but um, I'm gonna be a bit unfair and give you one of the audience questions, which I had wanted to work in earlier, which was, because uh, I suspect you'll probably be answering it anyway. Uh, how, how do we, uh, the America, compete effectively on the AI battleground when our adversaries aren't playing by the same rules? I don't know if that was on your list of things, but it is now. Uh, <laughs> I think I have an answer to this, but, okay. which is, uh, and it's also my summary statement here, which is I actually worry more about the risk of inaction than I do action. Okay. And, and this is intended to keep us ahead of our adversaries, but not rapidly embracing and mastering, mastering the technology for the IC missions, not resolving the question of how to handle U.S. persons' information that are either embedded in models or can be uh, regurgitated out of models, and then not resolving this question of whether to build or buy in, uh, models from the private sector building within the IC. Uh, I will also float one additional idea that, that uh, in this question of trying to uh, reduce risks from the use of AI models, uh, there is this idea that we've talked about, the idea of a national test bed uh, that can do classified work on uh, what, putting uh, AI models t through the paces, potentially producing pr dangerous results, but in a contained environment. So you have a, can, can have a consortium of individuals who are able to look at the results, and th this could look at nuclear weapons, cyber weapons, bioweapons, for example. Okay. In the 30 seconds, I'll All summarize right. there. Okay, great, good. Um, Lindsay, 59 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the big challenge for especially folks who sit in seats like mine um, is that we often talk about a natural tension between wanting to innovate faster and foster creative uses of technology in their development. And um, like Marissa and Lucy highlighted, the need in government to regulate and to take responsible approaches that include oversight and often things that are perceived to slow those processes down. Um, and then we talk about balancing these interests as if it's realistic to be trading off the speed of innovation for oversight or trading off oversight for the speed of innovation. I think the challenge that we need to be embracing moving forward is not thinking about things in those terms, but talking about governance, oversight, and responsible use, and thinking about ways to actually innovate there to make sure that we're keeping pace with what we need to be facilitating in terms of innovation and development. Great, well, lots and lots of food for thought, obviously, and I, I know the audience realizes we could go a lot longer. I did get a bunch of questions, although ma many of them were ones that we ended up touching upon, so if I didn't hit your question, I apologize. Uh, but let me uh, thank INSA, first of all, and most importantly, our, my four colleagues to my left who just uh, have a wealth of experience and we're sharing it with uh, all of us today, so thank you so much.